formally introduce our session today, Turning Learning into Profit, How L&D is Becoming the New Corporate Powerhouse. And with us today is Stephen Baer. Stephen is Chief Solutions Officer of ELB Learning, a Forbes.com thought leader and ad tech speaker with over 20 years of experience creating immersive training solutions. He focuses on leveraging e-learning, game-based learning, interactive video, and virtual reality to reskill learners, change behaviors, and foster continuous learning. Previously, Stephen was co-founder of the game agency and director of marketing at Atari Inc. So let's please welcome Stephen to the session. Stephen, if you'd like to start sharing your screen, the floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, okay. Let's see. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, this is a um, this is a takeoff of an article that I wrote um, a few years ago, talking about how um, the L and D department really is the uh, epicenter of profit in any organization, and sometimes doesn't get credit for that. And so, um, but I think that there's a there's an onus on us to do certain things to to be successful in doing that. Um, uh, just as a quick background before I get into it, um, I just wanted to at least introduce our company as well. Um, ELB Learning uh, is kind of a unique company. Uh, we are uh, headquartered just outside Salt Lake City. Um, we are about 500 people and uh, really focus in three different areas, uh, learning and business strategy, uh, custom services, and uh, technology. And by custom services, we build about 2,000 unique courses a year. And from a technology standpoint, we really have a whole suite of technology, some of which I'll touch upon today and others, which I'm happy to talk about at a later date. Um, I have two polls that I would like to start off with just to kind of set the stage for today's conversation. Um, and so hopefully everyone can just take a few minutes to participate in this. Uh, the first poll really is just getting a sense from this audience here uh, where your strengths are across the following categories. And I'm picking these categories because what we hear from executives are these nine or so categories are really uh, critical to the success of any organization. And as a result, something that certainly the L&D department uh, can influence and uh, really impact. So uh, Mel, maybe we can launch the first poll. Um, if you can pick your top three from an organization standpoint that, that, that you feel uh, you guys excel at. Mel, I'll, I will defer to you. You, you, um, when when you feel like it's tapered down, if you don't mind showing the results, and we can uh, review then. That's still going. We got about so fifty percent. Um, okay. Still going. So no, no rush. A, we got a big group, so let's give them some time to read through all of them. Right? <laughs> Think. <laughs> uh, apologies for the eye chart. I have a few of those today. You got a couple of people in chat giving you an overall score. <laughs> oh, Naomi, sorry. Yes, you. Um, if you're on a phone, it might be a little more challenging. The poll might not be working for you up on the mobile. Apologies. Okay, I'm gonna. We we we've, we've got about seventy percent people, so let's go ahead and end that poll. Okay, what, what results are we seeing here? Let's see. Okay, so we're seeing that from an uh, excelling standpoint, um, upskilling and reselling, uh, sorry, reskilling, uh, customer experience and satisfaction, and operational uh, efficiencies certainly are our top performers. Um, uh, leadership effectiveness uh, follows risk management. Uh, where are we falling, falling short? Let's see. So impacting growth and market expansion, uh, possibly in change management, financial management. Um, I don't know. That's good that that we're not that that we're falling short there. Hopefully, most of us know where our strengths are. But I, we wanted to put that one in, and because inevitably, sometimes we don't know where our strengths are, and that's important to look at as well. Um, I, I I think this is this is a good place to start as we think about. Uh, our our strengths in any of our individual organizations as it relates to the uh, 
critical um, expectations from our C-suite. And we'll come back to this, but I wanted to uh, take a look at this really quickly. And maybe we can all put this in the back of our, our heads. Um, one more poll that I want to do also to set the stage for today's uh, for today's talk. And that is, if you had to define within your organization, what the biggest profit center or driver is, I should say, which one of the five of these would you pick? All right, let's see what our results are. Well, products and services led the led led the charge here. Second to that was employees, uh, followed by sales and marketing, operations and efficiency, and finally technology innovation. So super interesting. I I have a premise that I'm gonna talk about today. And while I actually think all five of these are critical, the one that I think is actually the most critical is our people. Um, why, right? Our employees, they deliver clients, they deliver knowledge, they de deliver sales, inspiration, and the passion that's really pivotal for the success of any of our businesses. And so as, as L&D leaders, I think it's really critical for us to be thinking about our people as that biggest profit driver and what can we do to support them and make sure that they are successful and that as a result, our organizations are successful. So I'm gonna give you a number of stats that I think are super interesting, though we'll sprinkle them throughout. But this one was from Gallup. It talks about how companies with highly engaged employees are 21% more profitable and they outperform those with low engagement by 147% in earnings per share. And so, I will point continuously throughout this uh, webinar to the fact that the more we can engage and empower and improve our employees, the more successful organizations are going to be. And and I think that, you know, in inverse, I wanted to talk about when we don't do that, right? Um, a non-engaged employee can be extremely expensive. Um, in fact, the cost to replace an employee, and I know we all know this, but it's good to quantify it is 50 to 60% of their annual salary. And then once you layer in things like uh, training and onboarding and lost productivity, it's really 90 to 200% of their uh, salary. So when we are not advocating for uh, all the measures that are necessary to engage our employees uh, and train our employees and keep them at their peak, we're, we're actually costing the company money. So. You know, I, I like to start there. I think that's important. Today, I'm going to talk about eight priorities uh, that will result in highly engaged employees. And I, you know, I, I found a, across a number of the organizations that we work with at ELB that when companies are able to focus on all eight of these, certainly that is a gold standard. And when they're able to prioritize the majority, it still delivers quite phenomenal results. So let's talk about what those eight are, and then we'll go through them individually. The first one is aligning learning with organizational goals. And all these, I think you'll look at it, you know, on their own and say, well, of course. Um, but let's talk about, as we go through each of these, how we can do so effectively. The second is to provide personalized learning paths. The third is to provide mentorship and coaching. The fourth is to design interactive and collab collaborative learning. The fifth is to recognize and reward our learning achievements of our employees. Six is to provide opportunities for career development. Seven is to build culture of continuous learning. And eight is to ensure work-life balance and well-being. So let's let's dig into these one by one. When it comes to organization to aligning with organizational goals, 
What we hear from Brandon Hall is that 87% of companies say that the alignment between learning and business strategy is important or critical to achieving business goals. However, only 13% they were say that they were ready to take action on creating this alignment. So there's a gigantic discrepancy. And when uh, when we can, as L&D professionals, really bridge that gap, that's when we start to see success. So just returning back to these nine items that we started with, uh, with that first poll, I think it's important for us to take take note of which one of these within our individual organizations are most critical and to make sure that we are prioritizing them accordingly and making sure that we're thinking about the individual learner stakeholders that we have in our organization and ensuring that each of them are at the level that they need to be, right? None of this is rocket science, but it's a reminder to us that, that that's, that's, a, that's a kind of a, a step one that we have to a- absolutely do. Uh, companies that align their learning priorities with their business goals see a 218% higher income per employee and a 24% higher profit margin than those that don't. That's um, a by a study by uh, ATD. So how do we do that? Well, obviously we, and some of this once again is gonna be um, simple, but I think once again, a good reminder for all of us. The first thing is we do is we identify business objectives. We conduct skill gap analysis. We involve leadership in really um, validating the fact that uh, our assumptions are correct. We align our learning metrics with the business KPIs. We tailor the learning programs accordingly. We analyze the results. And last but not least, is we adjust the learning to make sure it's an optimal outcome. This eye chart on the right is a really important one. Um, And I I think that uh, it's something that we probably don't think about often enough. What we see is that over here where these blue charts are, these blue bars are, is where more often than not, L&D departments spend most of their time and most of their money, right? That's on the creating content, delivering content, but, and, and it's a critical part, right? But when, but when we look at these three big orange humps, that's what the company executives say is where they see the biggest um, value within the L&D department. So the first hump is really defining the need, really doing that upfront analysis and trying to build a strategy. The second hump is in creating content and delivering it. And the third hump is analyzing it and making sure that we're uh, improving over time. And what we see often enough is that the first strategy and the third analysis and refinement are are deprioritized. And when they are, often the result uh, is not what we want it to be. So. I'll start by saying that I think that it's important as organizations that we put more emphasis on all three of these components as opposed to uh, just that middle one. Uh, Number two, we're going to talk about providing personalized learning paths. Um, Easier said than done, by the way. Organizations that use uh, personalized learning paths are 92% more likely to see improved productivity and higher performance across their workforce. This is uh, by Josh Burson Academy. So let's talk about that a little bit. How do we do that? We set clear learning goals, right? So uh, that's you know defining objectives by the individual um, and aligning with long-term goals, right? We assess current skills and knowledge. Uh, we conduct employee assessments. We identify the skill gaps. We kind of talked about that earlier. We provide learning resources. That's curating content, building content, leveraging technologies. We create structured plans. So that's prioritizing areas of development, for the individual, breaking down learning into individual steps, setting a timeline, just thinking about the individual and how they learn, right? We tailor this learning to the styles, kind of what I was just talking about, but um, adapting to individual needs. So maybe that's visual or auditory or reading and writing uh, or, um, or, or or any of the above, right? And last but not least is regularly monitoring and adjusting. And so if we go back to that chart that I showed earlier, if we don't If we just put it out there and we don't analyze and improve, then we're doing ourselves and probably more importantly, our employees uh, a a disjustice. So uh, in an ideal world, no one should take the same path as another, right? We're all individuals, we all learn differently. And so you wanna make sure that we're really building paths that 
speak to the individual's learning needs, uh, styles, uh, skills, and so on and so forth. Number three, providing mentorship and coaching. And so this is, uh, I think, really important is that uh, in the last 10, 15 years, technology has played such an incredible role in changing the way that we uh, can mentor and we can coach employees. And when you leverage it most effectively, you can really scale efficiently. Uh, one area I'll certainly talk about is AI and how that plays into a lot of technologies. So let's talk about that a little bit. You know, one area that um, we, we focus on is video practice uh, and coaching. And so, you know, that is helping people understand key messaging, helping them work on their soft skills, empathy, delivering, uh, uh, you know, hard topics. That could be as a, a manager, that could be in negotiations, that could be sales, that could be customer service, but really giving that area to practice, right? Um, also giving them uh, feedback along the way, both um, AI-based as well as from a, a manager standpoint. Uh, also being very specific about where in the timeline of their delivery, they were successful and they were not. Um, we see that, you know, in, in our tool rehearsal, that on average, learners will spend about five and a half times practicing until they feel a level of mastery, right? But we also know that uh, in the real world, we only have normally one time to deliver it, right? So also using technology to, to do a, a, a hot seat, if you will, where you have one time to do it and you'll see if you pass or fail. Um, ha having those options is really important. Uh, this type of technology, and, and of course I'm, I'm showcasing rehearsal here as one, but there are others out there that we, you, you should be thinking about. All of them um, that are at least worth talking about are doing a phenomenal job of weaving in uh, AI today to really analyze what we're saying as learners, how we're delivering it, uh, what our words are, what our speed is, what our tonality is, how many ums we're using. How does it feel on the other side of the camera? And AI is really helping analyze that and not only provide feedback to the learner, but also provide feedback to their supervisor uh, to really think about where there's room for uh, mentorship and coaching. Okay. Number four, designing interactive and collaborative learning. 87% of employees are more satisfied with interactive and collaborative training experiences than with traditional methods. We all know this, right? Uh, the reality is, is that we have a shifting workforce these days, and we know that there are five generations in the workforce, and certainly uh, the combination of a younger workforce that is used to technology and interactive uh, components and, um, and, and, and micro components, they expect that. Uh, but it's not just about age. The reality is, is we all, regardless of what our age is, all engage with technology today in, in a similar way, uh, or a different way, I should say, than we did 10, 15 years ago. And that needs to be reflected in our training. And the, you know, when, when it is, the more engaging it is, uh, the more dynamic it is, the more successful we see it is. And, and why is that? Uh, well, for a few reasons, whether it's games, whether it's simulations, AR, VR, interactive video, in all cases, it requires the learner to really lean in. And when they're leaning in, they're more engaged, they're more focused, they're more emotionally connected to the content, they're more confident, and they're more apt to retain the training that you're delivering. And it, it, you know, there are eight points that I'm going to go through here, but this is one that I've been focusing on now for about 20 years. And regardless of the medium, when you're using something that is interactive uh, and immersive, you see the same results over and over again, a heightened level of focus, connection, confidence, and impact retention. So we'll talk about a few different ones. Um, you know, the first thing I, I, I lean on, and this is, as you heard from my bio, uh, this is the world I come from, the world of gaming, is thinking about how do you use games? Uh, and I'm showing here on the left-hand side, Bloom's Taxonomy, just thinking about different performance objectives we have. How do you use games to really uh, either teach, reinforce, or test any of these different skills that we want? And the reality is not all games are uh, really alike. Some do different things, and you really want to choose the right one for the right objective. 
Um, but it's not just about games. It's also thinking about how do you use gamification? And, and let me just step back and talk about what the difference is between the two. Games are obviously individual environments that you're playing. Uh, you're you know, going to try to complete that activity. You're going to try to master it. Um, you might have some obstacles to overcome. Um, but you know, from a learning perspective, uh, there's always going to be different types of um, uh, educational obstacles too, right? It might be, uh, have you mastered the knowledge retention? Have you, um, have you uh, been able to identify uh, the, an order of which something needs to go or what category something belongs in? Or uh, have, are you able to really master a certain uh, uh, soft skill situation and uh, navigate uh, your interactions with others? So those are games. Then gamification is where you start to take points and badges and leaderboards and prizes and apply it to all your learning, whether you're playing a game, whether you're watching a video, whether you're um, doing a task. And that's really interesting because um, you know some people, games speak to really well, actually a lot of people they do, but the level of motivation that is attached to, um, to, to a gamification really speaks to many people. Um, and so, you know, that, by the way, could be from an e-learning perspective. It could be from an in-person perspective. Uh, what I'm showing here is uh, really a combination of live learning, virtual instructor training, um, but you can do it in any of those environments. And the thing to think about with games is that they're, in, they're they certainly peak people's emotions. They're quite memorable because once again, you're requiring that person to lean in, right? In some cases, there are scenarios that they have to be able to relate to, characters, challenges. Um, all these things make the training a lot more, um, uh, uh, well, a lot more memorable as a result. Um, the other, you know, other modality I'm gonna talk about certainly when it comes to designing interactivity and collaboration is uh, virtual reality. And virtual reality is a fantastic tool in the right circumstances uh, to really immerse somebody into an environment. And that could be anywhere from uh, surgical training or te technical training or soft skill training, but it really puts someone strictly in that environment. One of the things to think about, by the way, when it comes to virtual reality is um, a lot of people think about goggles. And yes, that is absolutely um, uh, a, 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 a tool that's, uh, used most effectively, certainly for virtual reality. But we also know that about 20% of people can't handle the um, physical component of that and they get, um, they get a l little sick. So thinking about how do you use the, the premise of virtual reality and building 3D environments um, to immerse somebody uh, if they want to do it on their computer or their tablet or their phone. Um, one of our tools, Scenario VR, does a really great job of building it for any of those scenarios, goggles on down. Um, but in all these cases, you're really throwing the person, the learner, into that environment and bringing it to life. Um, uh, I want to talk about this next one because I think that uh, recognizing and rewarding achievement really ties to some of those components we just talked about. When I, and this is something that's near and dear to my heart, is how do you motivate learners? And when we think about motivation, we want to be thinking about it from two different vantage points. The first one is intrinsic motivation, right? Is um, are you helping them enjoy or sen get a sense of purpose or making them feel like they're growing as a result or being able to express themselves or find curiosity or passion or fun, right? This is the, the interest enjoyment of the task itself. This is for the person internally versus extrinsic motivation, right? I'm motivated to do this because I will get this. Perks, points, badges, prizes, leaderboards, a pay raise, bonuses, benefits, promotions. That is the extrinsic uh, component. Now, optimally, you want to be able to get both, right? And so when we think about when we're designing learning, we want to make sure that it is really achieving both of these because if you can motivate a learner uh, uh, from both vantage points, they are going to not only uh, come back to your training over and over again until they feel a sense of master, um, uh, a mastery, but they also will talk about it and they will recall it. Um, now, this one's an interesting one, right? As L&D departments, we often don't think, well, career development, 
um, where can we where can we play a role, right? We're here to teach. But the reality is, is that employees who feel that they're not developing new skills or growing in their roles are 10 times, sorry, 12 times more likely to leave companies, right? So it is really our, we have a tremendous opportunity to support that. And 94% of employees say that they would stay at a company longer if it invested in their career development, highlighting the importance of upskilling and enabling promotion opportunities, right? So once again, here, are these, these stats, I think, are uh, really uh, at our disposal to make a case to any of our corporate uh, uh, executives as to what the financial impact could be on our organizations uh, when an investment is made in our employees accordingly. So let's talk about that, right? Um, obviously, every, well, not every, but many learners really want to climb, they want to grow, and they want to see uh, a sense of um, you know, positive feedback on, on, on their careers, right? Uh, so upskilling, reskilling employees uh, is critical for this. Um, and, and helping them take on higher level roles and shifting is uh, critical as well. And so I pick these 10 different categories because what we see over and over again is organizations that really put a hyper focus on these 10 different learning categories, uh, see one, uh, a progression in their current employees, uh, two, uh, a reduced uh, turn rate, and three, uh, satisfied employees accordingly, right? So I, I wanted to call these out in particular. Uh, number seven, I wanna talk about building a culture of continuous learning, right? So we see that 94% of employees say that they'd stay longer at a company if it invested in their career development. We've heard this all over and over again. We see that employees at companies with strong learning cultures are 37% more productive. We see that companies that invest in continuous learning see 70% faster growth in new market opportunities. We see that innovative companies are 46% more likely to foster continuous learning than those that are less focused on innovation. And finally, and probably most importantly, we see that Companies that promote a culture of learning experience 218% uh, higher income per employee. So what do all these have in common? All these have in common that when you have continuous, this is meant to be an infinity symbol, continuous learning as part of your culture, uh, that there are some massive improvements to the bottom line, uh, to the top line and the bottom line. And so... This goes back to what I'm talking about, where we as the L&D professionals really have the opportunity to, to, to act as that um, engine behind any organization. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is ensuring work-life balance and well-being. Uh, you look on the right-hand side, you'll see the 30 nations that scored highest when it comes to work-life balance. Um, that's a combination of vacations, healthcare, um, worked hours, so on and so forth. Um, does anyone see who's missing? Well, there are lots of companies missing, the country's missing. But the one I want to call out is the United States. We're not on this list. And so it's, um, it's a tremendous opportunity for any of our organizations, um, many of which are global organizations, but I'm looking at it from the lens of the U.S. for tonight, for today's purposes, um, to really think about how can we uh, differentiate ourselves from a lot of our competitors in the U.S. market. So... Employee satisfaction and retention. L&D initiatives that focus on time management and stress reduction and prioritization skills can lower turnover rate by 25%. Mental and health, mental health and well-being, stretch man, stress management and mindfulness uh, contribute, contributes to a 20% reduction in sick leave. Burnout prevention, 94% of employees reported feeling less burned out when they had access, uh, they had access to um, focus well-being and work-life balance. And finally, organizations that provide well-being programs uh, as part of the L&D see a 50% fewer health insurance claims related to stress. And so all these, all these contribute to certainly the financials of any organization. And so I, I think it's important sometimes for us to shift the way that we look at uh, uh, our role from not just how do we deliver great training, but what can the impact that we have, what are the KPIs that align back with the, um, you know, just back to number one, right? The aligning with the uh, company uh, 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 priorities. Um, and what is the result? 
l and professionals who focus on these uh, and prioritize engaged employees, improve performance, um, drive business results, were recognized as corporate rainmakers. And this is really critical. So I wanted to stop here and we can talk certainly as an organization about what's working um, and, uh, and happy to take questions. But let's let's stop there, and uh, we'll go we'll go um, with with any questions that people have. Uh, I want that just came in um, as you were finishing up uh, from Julie. Two hundred and eighteen percent higher income that the employee makes for themselves or money brought to the company per employee. Is that was that the question about whether? That's, yeah, it was a question. Is it is it by is it the two hundred eighteen percent higher income per yeah, employee? It, it, it's by the individual employee. So on average, an employee is driving two hundred eighteen percent more um, top line revenue. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. So you know, look, each of these statistics are interesting in their own right, right? And and the reality is is that they're you know they're uh, groups of a uh, hundred to a thousand you know different. Um, uh, survey responders, right? But the rea reality is, is that we're seeing a positive direction of results um, when we take some of these actions. And that, that was a, a particularly interesting stat, I thought. Uh, if there are any questions for Stephen, please uh, put them in the Q&A. Uh, we do have one that came in. What metrics do you suggest L&D focus on to demonstrate value to leaders slash business partners? Yeah, so I'm going to jump back to... Um, these priorities, right? Because I think that, yeah, um, I think that when 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 you're trying to define your metrics, I think tying them to, and these are the nine that we certainly see over and over again, are the expectations of corporate executives. So uh, wh whether you can see um, improvements or reduction um, in 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 any of these categories, I think that that's where I would that's where I would hyper focus. Hey, um, I'm challenged with a team that has burnout. They have access to mental health and well-being opportunities, but don't use it. How do I change that? It's a great question. Um, I guess a few, few questions um, back, and 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 if we can go through a dialogue here, right? Um, I think that that some of that burnout um, comes down to cultural issues, right? So it'd be good to understand. Um, you know, not only what what are you doing to provide some of that um, uh, mental health and well being support, but also um, what is the what is the what is the culture that they're sitting in today um, when it comes down to um, the health of the business, the um, expectations of them as uh, employees are they um, are they reasonable uh, expectations. Um, how do they compare with, how do they benchmark against others uh, in your industry or similar functions? Um, uh, but, you know, one of the things we hear over and over again, and certainly probably um, disproportionately from a younger uh, uh, employee base, but is a desire to um, be um, invested in from a learning perspective, to have continuous learning. And some of that, by the way, is in our four walls. And some of that is um, having access to third party learning opportunities as well, right? And so that may be something to also think about is where can they grow? Where can they improve um, uh, both internally and externally? Okay, so based on your experience, what strategies can L&D professionals use to gain buy-in from organizational leaders? Do you have any tips or best practices to share? Yeah, so to me, um, I, the main reason that I brought all these data points today is that I, I feel like it is really critical um, to do two things. One is to be able to look at some of the data points. And by the way, I'll share these slides. So if any of these data points are helpful for you um, to uh, deliver uh, either uh, a, up, down, or across the organization, um, I, I encourage you to do so. I think they speak volume. Uh, now, granted, they're uh, from a macro view, 
So I think also some of the things that would be helpful for you as any, any of us to do in any organization is to benchmark. So obviously I'm, what these are, these are general, right? But it'd be really good to look at uh, if, if you can get some uh, benchmark data from uh, colleagues who are at other companies um, in, a similar, uh, in, in similar industries, I think that uh, to be able to provide that is really critical. Um, obviously in, um, in alignment with providing any of your data to them as well. Uh, but I feel like what we see over and over again is executive suites want to see the data uh, to be able to justify the spend and to be able to justify what the result would be or expected result would be. Uh, and until we were able to deliver that, and that's what, one of the reasons, once again, that I provided these, these, these examples, until we're able to deliver that, uh, it's hard sometimes to get their buy-in. Okay. Uh, what about the huge investment needed to integrate immersive learning, like buying AR, VR headsets for employee training? Is it worth the huge costs? Will it generate ROI? So one of the reasons I showed you Scenario VR, and I'm using that as an example, there are other tools out there, although I uh, can uh, biasly favor Scenario VR, is you don't need to have a headset um, to have immersive learning. So yes, if that's the experience you want, fantastic. If you have a workforce of 10,000 people, it's not worth the expense in my mind. Um, it's about, you know, at, at a certain point, there's a cutoff where you say, hey, I'm going to use this for an event, or I'm going to use this in a training center. Um, and I'm going to, you know, spend on 10, 15, 20, 50, 100 of these headsets. Great. Um, but once it gets uh, beyond that, I think that you can build really interesting 3D training that still immerses someone in a situation with other um, characters, environments that are all um, contextually relevant. And I think that when you do that, you give them an opportunity to learn in a virtual world and fail in a virtual world so they can be more successful in the real world. Um, you, don't need, you don't need the equipment. Um, and that's a really important thing that, to, that we should all keep in mind because that should not be a blocker. The other thing I'll say on that just real quick um, is that we've seen over the last five uh, years just a gigantic um, uh, leap ahead in technology. And so whether that's any of the technology I showed you today or a lot of the technology that's coming out with AI, which is phenomenal, we didn't even talk about, for instance, um, uh, and once again, I'm referencing our tools, but uh, I, you know, I, I imagine that some of this exists elsewhere as well. Within our scenario VR tool, which you know used to take, uh, you know, uh, you'd have to go and you'd have to get a 3D camera and you'd have to you know, produce some uh, footage in an environment and then you'd have to bring it back and layer it into a tool and then you have to do all this stuff. Today we have an AI wizard that can say you can write in and say, um, I would like to build a doctor's office. And I would like it to have this uh, color scheme, and I would like it to have this equipment. And I and you can take um, AI characters, and we just I just met with a vendor that does some really interesting stuff uh, along this way. And you can say I'd like to put these AI uh, these AI characters into the environment, and you can script it and say this is the you know this these are the types of scenarios, not necessarily even writing all the different branches, and it can do a lot of the work for you, and you can build those things in a day, two days. Uh, it, gone are the days that it takes weeks, months, uh, or beyond to build this stuff. Um, and gone are the days that you need uh, to have a, a headset for it to be successful. You can do things uh, uh, fast, efficient, uh, fast and cost effectively um, today. And I, I encourage everyone to um, uh, take take a, any of the tools that are out there and really um, and and really experiment with them. Uh, and, and by the way, you know, we see that whether you have the staff in house to do so to support you, great. If you need a, a third party like an ELB, great. If you want to uh, bring some of your interns in uh, and have them work on it because they really want to do cutting edge stuff, fantastic too. There's lots of ways to cut corners to get there. All right. Uh, do you have any guidance on cost per employee for training? For example, what percent of budget should be invested in learning assets and time? Well, so 
I, I've seen over and over again a statistic that um, shows that the average company, um, a, uh, at least in the U.S., spends about twelve hundred, thirteen hundred dollars per employee per year. Um, candidly, and once again, probably like many of us on this call, I'm quite biased. I feel like uh, we see over and over again when the uh, expense is put into making it uh, more effective. Uh, more regular, um, uh, you know, more engaging, the results are speak for themselves way beyond that. So that's a stat I see today. Um, I advocate, obviously, always for more than that. Um, but, but hopefully that's helpful. What specific KPIs other than sales can show the impact of L&D? Um, well, I think that this chart actually shows a lot of them, right? So, um, Sales certainly focus in, you know, focuses on that market growth, but can you get your, your organization to be more uh, efficient? Um, can you um, get them to adopt new digital technologies, right? Um, can you have better um, customer experiences, uh, uh, you know, post-sale? Um, can you lower your, your risk, um, you know, when it comes to compliance issues? Um, can you... Uh, can you retain employees and upskill them, reskill them instead of having to spend the money on hiring new people? Um, can you have a uh, more effective, longer lasting leadership? Um, I think all those probably um, are quite relevant. And if you're able to point to the metrics of any of those and benchmark where you are today versus maybe where your competitors are or where you want to be, I think that's where I would start. What recommendations do you have for organizing individual learning paths? So uh, I, I'm going to come back to this slide here. I think this is, um, uh, I'll get there. There we go. Um, I, I, I think this is, it comes down to the individual. There's obviously only so much variety that you can do, right? But um, thinking about the objectives that you have, not only for the individual, and their career and their advancement and what they're looking to do um, in the short and long term. I think then also looking at their individual skills and you know building a rubric that kind of looks at where, where they could be, where they are today, um, where they want to be. Um, then I think thinking about all the different types of content that you have access to, the stuff that you could build, stuff that you can buy, um, thinking about um, where do you want to prioritize their um, areas for development? Um, and what's the timeline to do that? Uh, I think last thing is probably really thinking about what their individual use cases are. Do they have different visual needs or auditory or reading, writing, or so on and so forth that are important to think about? Um, and I think all these combined really play a role in helping to build a very unique uh, path for individuals. Um, you, you can have access to lots of content. It's maybe not right for all people. And that's not just by level or by function. It's also by thinking about who they are as an individual. Do you have any experience with designing and implementing internal mentor slash coach marketplaces? Uh, so yeah, we, we've actually worked with a third party that I really like. Um, uh, their name is The Makings. Um, it's a, a European-based company. Um, and what I really like about what they've done is it's actually very similar to what I'm showing you here, um, but um, quite sophisticated in the way they do it. It's really looking at the individual um, that they have in any organization. Most of the focus they do happens to be on leadership training um, or, um, uh, or upskilling. Um, and they think about uh, from probably about 50 vantage points, who is this individual learner? Uh, and then they have uh, on the back end um, thousands of mentors that they have available to come in and work with uh, those people. And I'm going to get the, the timeline wrong, but I believe once a week they meet for something like 23 minutes. And it's extreme, and I, it's kind of an odd number, right? But it, it is whatever the number is. It's, I, think, I think that is what it is. Um, uh, and it's incredibly structured. Um, and it's about teaching them new skills. It's about doing check-ins. It's about keeping them on their toes and making sure that they're focused on certain things. Um, and it's using the combination of both um, those personal skills and technology to, to track uh, where they are 
and where they want to be. Uh, and it's about building really personalized plans for them uh, from a mentorship standpoint. Of course, you know, um, that is a, that's a high touch example. Um, the other, you know, the other example that I, I referenced earlier was thinking about, um, so I'm just trying to find it, uh, sorry, is, uh, thinking about how to use, uh, technology like rehearsal and that's low touch. That's really fast and easy to, to, to leverage. Um, and that's something that can scale quite quickly and quite cost effectively, um, and really can, uh, give you a sense as a supervisor where your, uh, individual learners, um, strengths and weaknesses are, uh, for you then to build a plan around. What method do you use to identify company strength? Well, I, I, once again, I, I don't mean to be a broken record, but I, I go back to, I go back to certainly uh, these organizational goals. And by the way, they may not be these nine, but these are the nine that we commonly see, right? And I think that the same way that we went through that exercise, um, you know, at the very beginning of this webinar of identifying where we were strong from an L&D perspective against these, I think uh, really the, the, the most effective thing you can do is work with your uh, executives and understand what um, metrics do they want uh, each of these items to be or others. Um, and then look at where your organizations are against each of these and then really force rank which priorities do we want to, um, you know, put above others uh, because obviously there's going to be room for growth in probably all nine or, or, or beyond. Right. But I think that that's an exercise you can certainly do with your executives to not only help them understand to, to really reflect on that data but also to um, advocate for where an L&D department can drive uh, the business results uh, and impact uh, the organization in a really meaningful way. Is it okay if organizations have a, an LMS in place for workforce training or should they also invest in an LXP? I think it depends on the organization. Um, you know, candidly, um, I, I find that LXP is often a um, is, is a is a marketing term for uh, a, a space, a learning management space that um, has been with us for decades, um, and I don't know that there's a lot more value. Um, so I think what you can do is, if you have uh, an LMS that you're happy with, I think that uh, one of the things it may or may not be doing is leveraging additional technologies to deliver training in a more engaging way or more effective way. And you can certainly layer those on top of it. So whether it's game-based training or video-based training or um, scenario-based training or, or whatnot, there are great tools out there that um, all plug and play into really much any LMS out there. So I don't know that you need to make a switch. How would you show for business leaders that there is a positive change in customer experience and satisfaction? What metrics would you use? Sure. Well, uh, so we, we uh, I'm, I'm just thinking about our organization alone. We, um, we ask, we ask our um, customers to um, rate their experience, not only with our, our products and our services, um, you know, as well as uh, we do, we do a lot of postmortem um, engagement with our, uh, with our clients. We also do quarterly business reviews. There's lots of opportunities to get data, whether it is automated or whether it is um, in, a, in a more formal sit-down environment. Um, and I think that if any organization that's not taking the time to get that data, I think you have to think about what you're selling, um, what, what your frequency of um, engagement with your customers are, uh, and um, and how candid they're willing to be. Uh, but I think that the more of that data that you can get, certainly the, um, the more that we see uh, our clients feel aligned to us because we're asking them. Uh, and they're more opt in many cases to provide more business to us because we're having that dialogue with them and really trying to make sure that we're delivering what they need. So... I, I, those are a few different ways, but I think it's imperative regardless which um, which approach you take. 
Okay, we have two more questions for you. This goes back to when you were kind of, you were showing the dollar figure per employee. Um, does the twelve hundred to thirteen hundred figure per employee include salaries for L and D staff or just training budget for learning? Uh, so that's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that. I think it includes, and I actually have this in a different deck. So if someone wants to take my, um, I mean, I'll once I'll bring up my uh, contact information. I'm pretty sure I have. Uh, some interesting data on that particular topic. Um, so uh, feel free to email me and I can see if I can surface that. But I think I have that information elsewhere. Okay, and I'm switching gears off of metrics. Just one last question. How can I work with an organization who doesn't seem receptive to games and gamif gamification and they just want to lecture? Um, well, Games and gamification aside, I think I would um, begin the conversation with uh, thinking about how we as people really learn and retain information. And, you know, I, I had a slide earlier in this presentation where I talked about making sure that the learner is leaning in. Uh, the more that they're actively leaning in and they're participating, the more that they're going to really uh, uh, soak in the information and retain that information. Uh, there's only so much we can get out of a talking head or a video or a lecture. Um, we tune out, we tune out quickly, especially in a day and age where we're all used to such micro content. Uh, the reality is, is I think just having that dialogue about uh, human behavior, games aside, whether it's games or video practice or, um, or immersive simulations, all those things require the learner to lean in. And when they lean in, they, they not only actively participate, but they recall the information a lot more. Um, and they fail, and they fail in that virtual environment. And that's really important because we want our learners to um, fail virtually so they can succeed um, in, in the real world. And uh, if we don't have those practice sessions, uh, we're not, we're not going to achieve that. Oh, one more question just came in. We still have the time. Yeah, we still have the time. So if you're thinking of any last minute questions. <laughs> uh, when it comes to customer training, do you have a recommendation on engaging adult learners all day long or half days? Um, I, I believe that we, you know, it, it, whether we burn out in our careers or we burn out in training, I feel like micro is really important, right? So um, I think you can do all day. But I also think that you need to think about how do you build those sessions so that they're most effective, right? If we're just talking to someone for, you know, eight hours straight, it's not going to be effective. So I think that one of the things you want to think about is um, uh, probably three three things. And I just heard this the other day. I thought it was quite wise. Um, one is is probably using a, a good chunk of that time to to talk and train people on stuff. But one of the things we've seen always is that you need to take breaks every 30 to 45 minutes to have some sort of activity. Those could be short activities, those could be 10 minute activities, but it allows someone to reflect on what they learned, lean in, it's almost like a, um, a knowledge check, uh, but sometimes even more importantly, a knowledge check with your buddies, the people who are sitting right next to you. So then it becomes a collaborative experience. Um, and then you can go back to, to talking more, right? But you can also layer in things like gamification where you can say, we have 100 people in this room and we're going to, you know, have a prize for the table that really implements what we just talked about most effectively. Great. That gets them uh, engaged and, and certainly participating. Um, the last thing you want to do when you're thinking about it, whether it's a half day or a full day, is to make sure that you have really interesting surprises throughout the day. Things that they're going to remember, they're going to say, that was unique. That was fun. That was interesting. They'll talk about it and they'll remember it. And so I think that combination of lecture, breaks, activities, and some special surprises along the way, whether it's four hours or eight hours, that combination is really critical. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, while you're talking, this was from Kathy Gates. She had a follow-up, but I, th I feel like you you just answered that. And how do you help the customer balance their regular job duties with a full week of training? So breaks for regular work. Um, she tends to have classes of 10 people, but I think you, you might have just sort of address that <laughs> as well. Yeah, uh, well, it's a little different. I think if, I, if I'm understanding the question correctly, which is look at the end of the day, we all have jobs that we need to get done, right? So 
Um, I was thinking more about um, from the from the perspective of um, while they're in training, you want to make sure that it's a variety of um, of activities. It's not just being lectured. It's also participating. It's also being rewarded and it's also being surprised. Right. But um, look, we all have a lot of pressure on us that um, the work doesn't stop while we're in training. So how do we make sure that we allow, allow for that? Whenever we do um, training internally at ELB, um, especially for you know full day sessions, um, we make sure that we have uh, breaks for people to check in, get anything that's critical done, so that when um, they are back in the training, they know that they're back in training. It's not back in training, but check your email every 10, 15, 20 minutes, right? Yeah. Kathy, I don't know if that helps, but that's that's uh, that's at least my perspective on the topic. She did say that helped, yes. Okay, good. Uh, uh, there was something you said about uh, surprises, quote unquote. What would you suggest as surprises? Um, look, I, I once again, um, as you know from my bio, I come from the world certainly of um, gaming. And I think that uh, that's not just about playing a game. It's about being rewarded. It's about um, competition. It's about uh, a level of excitement along the way. I think that the more of that that you can um, have in place, right? So you know, one of the things I often do when I'm talking um, to groups in person is um, I'll bring a game and I'll put, you know, $20 on the table. And I'll say, look, at the end of the day, um, whoever gets this right is going to win this, right? Or whoever wins this is going to um, get these 20 bucks out of my pocket. It's little things like that that are, uh, you know, nominal investments, but memorable from the people who are attending. Um, or having a leaderboard that it continues throughout the day. Um, that people are going to actually lean in because there's that competitive nature that we have. Those types of things I think are important. Um, certainly also calling out people who are um, uh, high performers uh, along the way, giving people certainly that level of um, uh, a praise, I think is really critical. Okay, well, we are a time. Uh, Julie just put something fun in, in chat. So the training I'll never forget is when they did randomly do knowledge checks and whoever got it right first would get a $3 gift card or Dunkin' I, or Starbucks or a free cup of coffee or something. I, I love that. But that's <laughs> such a good example, Julie, because it, it's $3, it's $3, right? And it's and, and you're talking about it possibly, you know, weeks, months, or years later, right? So yeah. Yeah. No, I don't think $3 would buy you a cup of coffee now um, at Starbucks, but it would help. <laughs> well, you have to win twice. You have to win twice. You have to win twice. Yeah. Well, um, we are at time. So thanks, uh, Stephen, and to ELB Learning for all this great um, information. Stephen, you weren't seeing it in chat. Everyone was saying how fabulous this was, especially the Q&A. Um, if you didn't look already, uh, we posted some documents for you. So scroll up in chat. You're still here. There's a copy of the slides. There's some other bonus materials as well. And uh, and if you're listening to the recording, uh, you can reach out to ELB Learning <laughs> to get these uh, as well. Um, I'm sure they'd be happy to send them to you and they'll be part of any follow-up from the organization. So thank you, Stephen. Thanks to all of you. You've been a wonderful group. Uh, the session was recorded and will be made available usually within a couple business days. You'll receive a follow-up email. Uh, but they're also, uh, I think they'll be up on the ELB Learning. They'll get a copy and have it up there as well. So thank you all. We hope you have a wonderful rest of the day wherever you are in the world. And we look forward to seeing you in future events. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Pleasure to meet you.